Okay, I will begin. Hi, I'm Anya Schifrin. I'm the Director of the Technology, Media, and Communications Specialization at SEPA. And we've been working for years now on questions of tech regulation, media policy, and um, really glad today to have this update uh, event organized as part of the Nigelo Rodin Digital Futures Forum with the Technology and Policy Initiative at SEPA, and also now the European Institute and Columbia World Projects. There's a lot of us at Columbia who are thinking about questions of regulation and, and media policy and internet governance. Uh, we have a very deep bench of people teaching and, and talking about this subject. And so the purpose of the panel today is really to just quickly bring us all up to date on what's happening in the EU with the digital services Act, which will probably get passed within the next six months and is going to address codes of conduct and practices around social harms, mis- and disinformation in Europe. Um, we have a panel of experts here. Their names are on, on the Zoom and they're also in the program, so we won't talk about them. But we were all remarking, you know, Anu Bradford and Marie Chishak, many, all of you are, are connected to Columbia, have been to Columbia before. You're, many of people in the audience will know you, but we were all remarking about how incredibly timely this panel is, giving every, given everything that's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, problems of Russian disinformation, of false information, of the role of platforms in you know, circulating it have been a worry in Europe for years. During the After the 2016 elections, there was immediate debate about, is this a Russia problem and a disinformation problem, or is this something larger? And so I think that looking in the, at the planned regulation in the context of what's going on right now makes this even more timely. We'll have, um, we have different uh, questions for each of the different panelists. Mutali Nakonde is, I'm happy to say our moderator, thank you so much for doing this. I know you were five hours at hearings in Washington yesterday, so we feel super lucky. I met with Paul Tong in November in Brussels, and he's really on top of a lot of the legislation. Everyone knows, right, Shashat, because you've been working on this for years. You're at Stanford now, but you've spoken at Columbia many times. Anu is at our law school and wrote one of the definitive books on sort of European, U.S. Uh, solutions, and Alan Goodman um, at Rutgers will be talking to us. I'm sure a little bit about the U influence on the US and all the things we have to worry about in terms of the First Amendment. So I think we'll have a really thorough examination of the DSA, what's happening, why it matters today, and what, if anything, will the US be adopting or copying or ignoring in the coming year? Thank you so much. And then we'll have a little bit of time for questions and we're being recorded. Thanks everybody. Thank you for that gracious um, in introduction, Anya. And I feel like I have the most interesting and exciting people in front of me to have this discussion. So I'm gonna go dive right in. I'm gonna start with you, Paul, um, if you don't mind, just to kind of bring the audience up to date with um, kind of where's the Digital Services Act now? Um, and, and what should we be thinking about that to kind of help frame the discussion for us? Um, there are in fact two uh, what I call sister laws. One is the Digital Market Act. One is the Digital Service Act. The Digital Service Act is about, as I say, the, the new the rules for the for the digital world, uh, mainly uh, invoking transparency. And the other one is the Digital Market Act, which try to regulate the market powers of the biggest tech companies in the world, and they are interlinked. Um, on both. Um, the European Parliament has taken position and uh, now this is of course very European, the, the European Parliament goes into the negotiations with uh, the Council, the Europe of the citizens meet with the Europe of the countries and they need to come to an agreement. And the expectation is that the Digital Market Act uh, will be the first to arrive, probably the, uh, the French hope to have it before the uh, presidential elections, so that, that can help to boost uh, the position of Emmanuel Macron. The Digital Services Act will take more time, but it should be done be, uh, before the summer. And sometimes these files are interlinked. Um, one of the heated debates is on, uh, for example, on the use of personal data for tracking and targeting, personalized ads. Uh, that is both in the DMA and the Digital Services Act, and really the European Parliament is pushing 
to make sure that um, uh, that this is uh, that in both in both files. Now, and this is why I'm also happy with this meeting um, because I really think we can reinforce each other on other on both sides of the, the Atlantic. Uh, so I was very pleased to see that Joe Biden yesterday made very clear remarks on targeted ads at miners. Uh, that's also, in fact, also helping the position in uh, in, uh, in Parliament because we need to, let's say, convince uh, the council to uh, to come uh, to come on our side. Oh my goodness! Um, yes, certainly. Um, and turning to you, um, Anu, given the moment that we're in, um, where tech companies are really regulating. On, on behalf of Ukraine, if that's your position, right? There, you have Google turning down Google Maps and all of that kind of thing. What elements of this act do you think could be not just helpful to the US, but what makes them so relevant about this particular moment that we find ourselves in? Thank you so much, uh, Mutale, and really uh, glad to be sharing this important conversation. So I think it is obvious for us, but only heightened uh, through this conflict, that we have tech companies making crucially important choices. And there's often this uh, notion that the tech companies invoke saying that we can't really be regulated. The legislators, legislators don't understand technology. Well, my worry is that these companies don't understand democracy and they don't understand geopolitics to the extent that we can leave it for them to, to uh, make uh, these decisions. At the same time, of all the domains of digital economy that we are trying to regulate, I do believe that regulating speech online is one of the hardest ones, and you can err in both directions. And even those with the best intentions don't always have it right. So if we keep that in mind, then the question is who should be drawing those lines? And I think the first thing to be, to, to be reminded of when you analyze the DSA in the US is that Brussels is not proposing that somehow now we would have the bureaucrats in the EU to seize control of the platforms and start censoring speech. I, I believe that the approach that the DSA adopts is the potentially only feasible path forward in the United States as well, that it really focuses on accountability and transparency. So it still maintains the liability shield. And that is, I think, very important for the American conversation. But at the same time, it sheds light on how these companies go about making those decisions so that we can have a democratic conversation about the kind of line drawing that takes place, how those algorithms are being built, what kind of effect they have on our society uh, based on the decisions uh, that are being made. So I believe that this fundamental uh, framework of how the DSA is being structured is very instructive and something that the Americans would be more comfortable in following as well, because the question is not that you face a choice between free speech or the end of it. This legislation is not the end of free speech. It is trying to bring a public aware of the, the choices that are being made and, and have a public conversation about it. So um, I think the entire uh, set of provisions to enhance transparency and accountability are something that could be very informative for the conversation in the US so that the users know, for instance, um, why they are being targeted by some kind of advertisements, who is paying for those ads, so who is behind this? The idea that we would have annual transparency reports, um, we generally have more algorithmic transparency. I have a very hard time to say why that would not be consistent with the kind of ethos of American way to think about the role of the platforms as well. Um, I also paid close attention to President Biden elevating the targeted advertising on minors. I thought that was significant. And I think also correctly identified something where I believe that when some choices are being made, uh, that should be the obvious one. It should be the kind of issue where I think broad population can go behind this. And so much that we know uh, about uh, the effect on uh, on minors in particular, uh, and might be a roadmap forward in the United States as well. There's another one that I would I would note uh, that the Europeans are doing. There was a lot of criticism in the US that the GDPR, for instance, was suboptimal for many reasons, one of them being that it was really hitting the smaller companies harder and um, in, uh, ultimately then entrenching the power of the big tech companies. Well, That's the DSA is explicitly asymmetrical 
in imposing greater obligations on the very large online platforms. And, and I think that, that is- that, Sorry, at that junction, this is great, but I do just want to bring some other people into the conversation. Absolutely, we can because, leave it there. But um, I could speak about this all day. So um, if it's ever safe for us to meet Anu, let's speak about this all day, all night. I am as passionate as you for sure. Just turning to um, um, Professor Goodman, Alan, um, given everything that we've heard in terms of how the DSA could be instructive to US policymakers, how realistic do you think this is given the legislative environment in which we're operating in the US and specifically around gridlock? Um, I'd love to hear from you what you think we could get, what you think we'd have to leave on the table and how we can you know, get as close as possible to solving some of these huge problems. So realistically, we only have a few months of legislative um, activity until um, the, the midterm elections when you know the Congress is likely to change. And so um, anything that would pass would have to be um, bipartisan, but um, there are some areas of agreement uh, on the right and on the left, and maybe we can talk about them when we drill down. I, I One thing I think just for table setting that's important to um, uh, to understand about the US environment is that any piece of legislation has to not only have the substantive rules, but it also has to sort of create regulatory capacity. Because in the US, there really is not a regulator who's in a position to enforce any transparency, accountability, substantive rules on platforms. Um, and so what you see in US proposed legislation, what many of them do is they sort of start with creating that regulatory capacity, usually within the Federal Trade Commission, um, which, you know, it's just important to understand that it is, a, it is an agency right now. It's the closest we have to a platform regulator, and it's an agency with only a thousand people who are divided between their competition responsibilities and their consumer protection responsibilities. So, you know, anything that passes also has to have a provision, I believe, to increase the capacity of the regulator and to give it new powers. And then maybe later we can talk about specific bills and specific aspects of the DSA that I think have a chance of, of being passed. Thank you for that. And that's kind of um, bringing you into this conversation, uh, Marisha. Am I saying your name correctly? Yep, very good, thank you. <laughs> well, people mispronounce my name all the time and then I mispronounce theirs, so I'm very, very- It's um, okay, don't worry about it. That. The question I really want to ask you is around the bill and the timeline, but before you even get to that, I'm really curious to how the current um, situation in the Ukraine impacts any type of legislative uh, capacity the EU has, and if it will, in fact, impact um, the DSA or the DMA, because I see these bills as, had they've been enacted, potentially really useful in this particular, converse, um, this particular conversation. And mm -hmm. I know that that's where your, um, that's, that's where your time is right now. So if you wouldn't mind kind of parsing out those two huge yeah. questions that you could speak to forever about. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And um, I'm happy to meet with, with all of you, even in these uh, difficult times. So we've obviously seen um, game-changing events happening that I think will have ripple effects for decades to come. And I just want to say how much um, I think the, the Ukrainian population suffers in a completely unjust, uh, aggressive invasion that uh, should, should be condemned for the war crimes that are committed there. There has also been game-changing behavior by tech companies in a way that I think, you know, one week ago, two weeks ago, one month ago would have seemed unimaginable. The, the companies have taken steps that were probably the whole thinking behind the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, which is really, they should take more responsibility for their size and their power to curate um, content and also to moderate it. Now, in reaction to the Russian aggression, there have been ad hoc sanctions, including on state propaganda. But a couple of tech platforms, including Facebook, for example, had already said that they would not uh, allow um, state propaganda. The problem is that research shows that in the case of Russia, for example, 91% 
of content that Facebook itself labels as undesirable or you know, unacceptable for its platform still gets through. So I think there are a lot of questions about not only what platforms promise to do, even in these you know, very uh, challenging times, but also in how we can verify that they're actually succeeding. And there are a couple of elements that maybe we can talk about more, which is, you know, can content moderation at this scale be done successfully through automation? Or is there more human um, um, capital and in human expertise necessary? If so, are these billion dollar companies investing the way they should? Can the role of these moderators be verified and how to protect the type of outsourcing to the global south where essentially new human rights abuses are created. I mean, Time Magazine had a very good article uh, two weeks ago, I believe. I've lost track of time a little bit. I think it was two weeks ago on um, outsourcing to Kenya where content moderators end up having uh, post-traumatic post stress syndrome are being underpaid and exploited. So essentially there is a lot of harm uh, and harmful content that goes around on the big social media platforms that has led to empowering the kinds of people like Vladimir Putin. There's no doubt about it. Um, Russia today boasts about being viewed, you know, billions of times on YouTube and so on. This week is a game changer, but we should also really learn lessons about why it had to take such a devastating war for the companies to appreciate how powerful they really are and how much of a lack of countervailing powers there are um, to, to balance them out and to apply independent oversight. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm, t I'm terrified of um, Facebook meta, face meta, meta book. However, they have rebranded themselves every day, but that has that is um, particularly chilling. Turning back to you, um, Paul, will, and, and this is my favorite question, um, just because of my own work on algorithmic accountability in the US, and um, what's what's really a question in that bill is this create this um, creation of impact assessments, like making sure that we know the technology does what what the technology does before it gets there. And that seems to be one of the elements of the DSA that is most interesting, at least in my mind, to American policymakers. Can you speak more about that provision and specifically this question of innovation? Because we often hear by introducing impact assessments, we are going to de-incentivize innovation and the innovation economy. Um, I would love to hear you uh, your remarks on that and how you're thinking about it in the context of the DSA. Yeah, I, I agree with you. This is one of the most exciting parts in the, in the DSA. It's, it tries to crack open the black box of the algorithms uh, or more general of the, of the, of the, uh, the digital services. And um, I think a word for this is due diligence. You try to identify the risks uh, and uh, subsequently you are asked, what do you do to prevent or mitigate the risks? And that is a common concept in, uh, let's say, in corporate life in Europe. It's also for the discussion, uh, for uh, we have this discussion on, uh, on child labor or damage to the environment. But it also applies to the to the to the digital services, uh, and then most notably in those of the of the biggest platforms. And um, so, they need to take a risk assessment. What is the risk, not just for the users, but for the society as a whole, uh, and need to find ways to address these risks. Now, take for example TikTok. Um, we see that they are very popular under the young. Um, they provide challenges that are sometimes endangering the young, right? So now this is the instrument for us to, uh, to make sure that TikTok identifies this risk and also now is obliged to, to take this risk into account. So I think it's, um, it, it goes beyond, beyond transparency. It's indeed to accountability. Uh, and that is, uh, that, that is crucial if you want to, well, see what the consequences. In my mind, it could be broader reaching. It's something that needs to be developed, I think. How do we assess, uh, how do we assess the algorithms? I, uh, sometimes that's also, uh, well, it's a question with an, with an unclear answer yet. 
But my hope is that it will defer, develop a practice in need where these risk assessments become a very important tool to, uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, the impact on our societies, and for example, on our children, is, is what we want. Now, is this a stifling innovation? No, I would say it's, it's redirecting innovation. Not everything goes. Now it is money talk, so to say. If it sells, it's okay. And this information is one of the things that sells people are um, um, uh, people are hooked, let's say, hooked to kinds of disinformation that confirms what they already think, or they they are drawn into um, a polarized uh, debate where they can take sides because this is what they what the platform sells is disagreement and preferably indignant disagreement. This is what sells and what what gets and keep our attention and that's what they want. Um, so. Uh, I would say it redirects innovation rather than uh, still, uh, uh, rather block innovation, and I think uh, the digital world becomes safer for it. I really like that this idea of redirecting um, innovation. Um, Anu, I'm going to direct a question to you around enforcement because I think Ellen brought up a really good point of the lack of enforcement potentially in the US environment, but how what you're thinking is around enforcement of this rule uh, in the in the EU. And then after that question, Ellen, I'm going to um, it, I'm going to ask you to ask the question that you posed in the chat, which I think is uh, brilliant also. So over to you, Anu, first around enforcement. Thank you. So um, as a uh, lawyer, we are very conscious of issues that we have laws in books and then we have laws in action. And it's really important that we don't just have the good laws in books, but that those laws are actually enforced. And you are absolutely right. And I think Ellen was spot on in, in acknowledging the importance of enforcement. And I think the Europeans are now aware of the deficiencies when it comes to the enforcement of the GDPR. There is a very serious conversation in taking those lessons in and the key questions question is whether we are actually adjusting and, and learning from those lessons in terms of uh, adopting the GDPR enforcement regime, but also the enforcement of the DSA. So the big question in Europe has been that can we really trust the member states, including them, placing the same heavy burden on Dublin? where the headquarters of many of these tech companies are to, to uh, enforce the DSA um, or whether we should centralize it or spread it across so that we have Berlin and Paris and the others play a larger role. So it is a mighty task to try to do that. If you think about the budget of the Irish privacy uh, 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 enforcer, so they privacy regulator, their annual budget is about the same that the big tech companies headquartered in Dublin make every 10 minutes. So there's a massive uh, revenue discrepancy there. And I think there needs to be a real commitment to vest the enforcement, uh, the, uh, the, the powers with the, the resources and the technical expertise. But let me just mention one more thing. How we think about enforcement is not just whether you can leverage sanctions. And we have an additional enforcement mechanism that is gaining importance, and that is reputation. So the tech companies no longer have the leverage to try to push the boundaries and see what they get away with. And this idea of transparency also contributes to that. We now have a public that is intensely aware of the ways that they are running their platforms. And I think we'll also make it harder for them to try to get away even there where the enforcement is not perfect. I definitely, as somebody that works in communications, is a scholar of communications, public, I always say public pressure is, is much more powerful than private money. And as long as we know, we can demand. I am going to go um, to bring you back into the conversation, um, uh, Ellen, just to make sure that your question, just to make sure that your question was answered um, in terms of enforcement in the G, uh, G, GDPR, or if you wanted to expand. And before I bring you in, just to remind the audience that we will be breaking for questions pretty soon. Please put them in the Q&A box. I did say the chat, this is only the third year of Zoom and I still don't know how to use it or what things are called. So please do forgive me, but we're looking forward to bringing you into the conversation as well. I'm gonna hand to you, Ellen, for any follow-up. No, thank you. I, I appreciate um, Anu's comments. And I, I guess the other thing I would, I mean, I'm a little obsessed with um, enforcement also because as you know, the most likely of these provisions that would be adopted in the US are certainly things having to do with kids 
advertising and transparency. And so I think, you know, as I knew laid out in the beginning, trans there's there's a there's a very well healed tradition of transparency regulation that is um, sort of low hanging fruit in some ways until you get to enforcement. And so if you begin to spin out the ideas of, you know, to the extent that revealing algorithmic choices starts to look like um, editorial policy, and then you have an enforcement um, of, of those, uh, you know, an investigation of those choices or an enforcement of, around the transparency, you can see that the arguments, I don't think they're, most of them are not meritorious, but you can see that the arguments become powerful, that government is stepping in to, um, to regulate editorial policy. And at least in the US context, that creates a lot of um, friction around these proposals. Yeah, I can, I can definitely, I mean, I, I think the point well taken from Anu earlier that this is not about regulating free speech, but I can almost hear uh, that around um, editorial. So um, going back to you, um, uh, Mauritia, is there anything that we should know as an audience around how the di digital services, excuse me, Digital Services Act. I have no idea how people working with these bills every day say that and, and don't bite their tongues. And the Digital Marketing Act work together. I think Paul did a really, really good job of kind of telling us what they were and, and how, you know, how they potentially could be in conversation. But I would love you just to draw that out for us um, a bit more, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. I think the, the complexity is why people talk of the DSA and the DMA, but then it's still helpful to know, you know, what is what. Um, a couple of main points that I think are helpful for the audience. One is that these two bills, which are often thought of as twins, um, try to bring forward the obligations of on companies. So not just to hope for good enforcement, which is a challenge, or hope for good outcomes in courts, which can take years and years and years to drag out. Um, and, and in the meantime, give advantages to the big companies that are involved. So the Digital Services Act spells out more clearly what is expected of platforms in particular when it comes to content moderation and the Digital Markets Act does the same, but with regard to their market um, power. So it's an it's basically a an, an clarification of antitrust rules typically, right? Uh, what is, what is uh, acceptable and not acceptable? What is the role of a gatekeeper? Um, how must they interact with small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, avoid abusing their view of the market? When you think about a company like Amazon, which can you know, do data analytics and then place its, its uh, home brand products onto the platform, which would all be uh, restricted. So the idea is to um, be, be more clear about what, what the law uh, expects. Secondly, and I think that that's also important, uh, I spent time in the US and in the EU, and I know how important the First Amendment is. There's no doubt that free speech is very important in the EU as well. But sometimes in these discussions about platforms and freedom of expression, it almost looks as if freedom of expression is the only fundamental right that we have. Even if freedom from discrimination or public safety or public health are also really important rights to protect. The, the protection of minors, which was mentioned in the State of the Union yesterday, which I think actually is something that Americans are more sensitive to oftentimes than Europeans. The point being that I, I think we've reached a point where these companies are so powerful that looking at them only through the lens of the First Amendment or speech really almost creates a tunnel vision. Uh, and I think that it, it is also the reason why in the United States there's been a lack of catching up with the laws. And I hope that both, you know, a new uh, energy in the transatlantic relation and uh, a new appreciation of the harms that can come from an under-regulated marketplace have also become clear to Americans. I mean, it's, it's only a little bit over a year ago that the U.S. Capitol was stormed, which seemed like a groundbreaking event at the time. We are now uh, looking at, at war in and against Europe, uh, disinformation waged against our elections, um, all kinds of terrible harms that really, really need addressing. So I can only hope that there can be a meeting of minds and a more comprehensive look 
at what is at stake, which I do think is very fundamental and also needs protection. Yeah, wonderfully, wonderfully said, and and I I echo your sentiment that we shouldn't we shouldn't wait for the worst possible situation to to take um, right headed action. I have um, a question that has come in for uh, for Paul, um, and um, what could could you speak a little about what has been taken from the bill? Um, over the last six months, have you had to negotiate protections out around journalism, bans on micro-targeting? If you can, speak about some of those negotiations and, and how and if can you, can you bolster for that? Well, I think that um, much of the discussion, uh, one of the discussion I already mentioned, and it will be until the end, is one of the, is one on targeted debts, which was brought in by Parliament in the Digital Service Act, uh, and it's now in discussion uh, with the Council and will continue to go on. Um, one of the other discussions that was in the Parliament but didn't uh, didn't make it to this uh, text was the media exemptions. Uh, do we need to have media exemptions from including for fake news, which is all the more relevant since we now have excluded uh, Russia today, um, for example, from uh, the, from the media from the media landscape. So they see no media exception. Um, so these are the discussions that we we have seen in the Parliament that have made changes or didn't make it to changes in the, in the, in the legislation. Um, but um, one of the issues that, that will keep blinking on is targeted X, but also the concept of interoperability will be key in, uh, uh, in the discussion. Interoperability sounds like a technical term, it is not. It's about promoting competition. Uh, make and diversity in in, uh, in in services, but you see that uh, what what you often see is that the discussion becomes very technical, whereas to, you can use concepts that are very traditional to us, like in this case free entry and competition, um, uh, to explain what we want to achieve with that, and that has been also very prominent in the in the in the parliament position, but we, we need to we need to fight for it until uh, till the last uh, till the last end, and that I find striking by the way, and this is the other way around what I've observing. Only, credibly, I came to the to the understanding it's not about the technology; uh, it's also about monopoly power. So like Marietje said, it's it's about being big, and we have the tools also from competition policy. Uh, but we don't want to use them ex post through all the court cases, but ex ante, and we need to address this. And this is where you see that, the, for example, Europe can still learn from the US. I'm very, I'm looking, um, for example, in the development in the US with the executive order of Biden stressing competition with the nomination of Lina Khan for the FTC. And I am such much more hopeful that the, the, the debate in the US will also have an impact on the EU because I don't see at this stage the the, uh, the willingness in the in in Brussels to make cuts in the big tech and to to make uh, to decrease their dominance and one reason why I think it's important it's not just about the disinformation that's being spread through social media platforms it's also that the the growth in social media has to the detriment of the traditional media because the advertising money is redirected from the traditional media to the google and facebook most notably so we also see an impoverishment of traditional media where we still had the principles of editorial independence and plurality and we don't have that in the, in the social media so if we want to fight this information it's not just about making sure that the dissemination of uh, this information is, um, um, uh, is hampered, but also make sure that we keep a good position of the, of the traditional media, because this is where you uh, can, um, can challenge fake news. Thank you so much. I have one more question before we open it up, and this is for you, Anu. Um, going back to enforcement, um, which countries will enforce um, within the EU, in your estimation? Um, or do you think there is going to be a, a new regulator within the European Union who, whose job it will be to 
uh, kind of make sure that this, these, these acts have teeth? So we generally have three models of enforcement when it comes to tech regulation in the EU. So one is the one that we have in competition law space, and that is now carried over the DMA, meaning it's centralized. It comes from Brussels and the commission is in charge. The second one is that we have a decentralized enforcement where the member states are enforcing the common European rules. That's the approach, for instance, in the GDPR. And that is generally approach in the proposed form of the DSA with the idea that we can still have the biggest cases that would go to the Commission. And the third one has been this idea of a form of self-regulation that we've had with the hate speech code, the disinformation code, whereby there are a codes negotiated within the platforms and the commission, but it's, it's mainly the platforms are enforcing them. So I think that is one I mentioned earlier, one of the big debates, whether the right approach is to go forward with the decentralized enforcement and whether then the defining enforcement in enforcer across the member states is determined by where the headquarters are. So I think ultimately it is not a problematic model in principle, but it has disproportionately burdened and really relies on the success of a handful of key agencies. Wow, lots to consider. Thank you so much for the questions in the Q&A. Um, I certainly appreciate them um, because <laughs> for many reasons, first, it doesn't mean that we, it means we won't have that time, but some of them are long. So do um, do forgive me. Um, I was wondering if I could ask a follow up of um, Anu, which is that if enforcement takes place where the companies have their headquarters, then won't there be a lot of capture? I'm thinking of Ireland or Malta. Wouldn't it be better to have the enforcement be in Brussels? Yeah, or then whether the capture, the target of the capture is the Brussels, or is it easier to try to uh, change the views of the legislators and enforcers in Dublin? So one idea why we have seen a tremendous increase in lobbying activity, if you look at the amounts that the tech companies are spending right now in Brussels, is a clear indication uh, that they know that that's where the, the, the chief regulator lies, and that's where the pickets payoffs are to be had. And in my own work on the Brussels effect that suggests that what happens in Brussels actually reverberates across the global marketplace, the idea if you capture Brussels, you basically capture the world if you take that to an extreme. So, so I think, Anya, that is an absolutely key question. And whether we have greater faith in uh, the Brussels institutions being able to resist the kind of lobbying or whether, and I don't know exactly uh, the, the, the forces in, in Ireland and we don't have as good uh, research, or at least I am not on the top of that on, uh, on the lobbying in the context of the Irish agencies. We have some interesting studies on the lobbying in Brussels and they, they seem at least until recently, at least more encouraging than the studies on the effect of lobbying in the United States. Namely, that in Europe, the civil society, NGOs, have great, relatively greater access to legislators in Europe than they do in the United States, where they are largely marginalized, and it's basically just the corporate lobby. But um, we have seen this shift, as I mentioned, of lobbying increasing, so the pressure to be able to resist that is certainly only going up as well. I don't know why I keep doing this work, so I'm constantly terrified and convinced that the world is going to end and we should all just get off the internet, but I think... I may be a bit late for that. So we have a number of um, questions from the audience. Please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Um, they are quite long, so I'll try and go slowly to make sure that we get um, to the heart of them. The first one is coming in from um, Anna, Anna Marquis. Uh, Anna says, how do current approaches to platform regulation and algorithmic decision making impact the relative power of workers within both private firms and government agencies? And then the second part of that question is, might the human-centered approach of the EU proposals leave these employees with little standing, um, with much of the blame or the burden? Uh, and so I think the first part of that question is, how, are, how will these proposals uh, impact uh, the lowest uh, tiered workers and then um, will they be left to blame? I'm not sure who 
Who feels best um, suited for that question? Shall I have a stab at it? No, I, th I think it's a good question, but I don't think the assumption in Brussels is that with the DSA and the DMA, you can really correct the, the position of platform workers. So there's a, sp a separate initiative also to make sure that platform workers have in a good position. Um, and there you see, um, uh, which is a, a mixture of, let's say, um, uh, more digital issues, access to data, understanding algorithms, but also traditional labor market instruments, making sure that they have a minimum wage, for example, the hourly minimum wage. So um, I don't think the, the idea here is that it will do enough for the, for the platform workers, that you need a separate initiative to make sure that they are in a good position. Thank you. Would anybody else like to? Okay, I can go on. This is uh, coming from, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Alan, were you unmuting? I, I would, I, it's not that important, but I, I sort of think it depends on which kind of workers we're talking about. So if we're talking at sort of at upper level, sort of Francis Haugen type, I think these interventions are empowering. Um, if, if we're talking about content, human content moderators, and I think maybe that is the, that was the thrust of the question, um, obviously they are going to be more burdened. Um, and I think whether or not they are overburdened or unfairly treated is a matter of going to be a matter of labor law, not so much the provisions of, of these acts. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, where the questioner hasn't presented it to anybody, please, anybody come in. And if I'm going too quickly, just stop me because we definitely want to hear from everybody here. The next question is from um, Alicia Osado, who is um, from Genoa Law School, faculty at Genoa Law School. So certainly welcome, Professor Sadio. Um, the question reads, you discussed enforce, oh wait, okay, I cannot read it. Here we go. Um, I'm assuming this is going to be for you, um, Alan, or um, it says you discussed enforcement in the US. Could you please tell us something about the judicial response to editorial issues with an eye on any commercial speech? Uh, this might be relevant to you as well, Anu. The questioner then goes on to ask, have there been any landmark cases? So I'm going to go to you potentially first, Alan, to talk about uh, judicial response to editorial issues. Yeah, I'll just be very general, which is to say that um, U.S. jurisprudence at the Supreme Court um, level right now is becoming much, much more um, protective even of commercial speech. And so in some sense, that makes regulation harder as, as much as, you know, I agree that we shouldn't be looking at this from a speech perspective. I think those are um, jurisprudentially, those are obstacles. At the same time, we may be looking at the law moving um, there's been a lot of talk about changing defamation law in the U.S. and being less protective. And so there are, there are currents moving in different directions. The one thing, you know, I do think is important to consider um, to the extent that we want to move forward uh, consumer protection and sort of tech accountability law in the U.S., I think it's better to move it forward as general, as the Algorithmic Accountability Act does, as general as possible which is a different approach from the DSA. So it's not necessarily talking about online platforms specifically, um, but more generally talking about tech and tech accountability. I think those have a stronger chance of surviving this kind of First Amendment scrutiny. And I'm just gonna, while we have your um, remarkable mind, just ask, uh, put it out there, any landmark cases um, that we can speak to around that? It's, it's really just a question, I think. I mean, there's Sor Sorel is the is the sort of landmark case that um, provides a lot is very speech protective. That the, mm -hmm. that the questioner might be thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we can mention Reno. We can mention Prodigy. There are these cases where the Supreme Court is very clearly uh, protecting the the liability shield uh, of the the, uh, the Communications uh, Decency Act, and we haven't seen a a shift in that approach. And the question is, what might be the next kind of cases where we would test whether there is a shift? So what kind of cases would we prepare and take them to the Supreme Court? And whether we actually, anybody would expect in this conservative court that we would get any different kind of reading uh, from, the, uh, from the Supreme Court. But it would be remarkable to hold the line if you think about how much more we've learned about how internet works and how public speech in that domain has evolved. 
So it would be quite staggering to see the Supreme Court not adjusting, uh, given in light of the information that we have. Thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from uh, Nadia um, Kahar Kaharani. Um, uh, and Nadia asks, the, she's really asking, excuse me, or they're really asking about the definition of the term gatekeeper within the, t the context of the DMA. So it stated that there are eight criteria for core platform services. Um, is this written in hierarchy order of each of the, or, or, is this in hierarchy order or are each eight mutually exclusive? And I am gonna uh, pass that to you, um, uh, Marisha. Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, as far as I understand, they are not hierarchical, but they are criteria uh, in terms of types of services there are. So, you know, a platform, a search engine, um, that sort of stuff. It also actually includes operating systems, cloud computing services. But besides that, there are also uh, two other aspects to keep in mind. Qualitative criteria of a gatekeeper. So having a significant impact on the internal market or operating as a core platform service, which serves as a gateway for both um, uh, consumers and, and other businesses, and that there could, could be a process of entrenchment. So besides the eight criteria, uh, qualitative criteria, but also quantitative. So about the size, the market power, the amount of users, active users, and so on and so forth. And so it's a combination with some of them being more spelled out in terms of, okay, we're, we're looking at this type of service, then we're looking at this type of size, and then we're looking at this type of service. And so I think there is um, a good indicator, but there's also flexibility because obviously markets evolve. We've probably seen uh, all of us um, how much, uh, for example, these share values of uh, Facebook dropped in the past couple of weeks. And some people were saying, well, maybe they wouldn't even meet certain criteria of significant market power anymore. Uh, maybe newcomers uh, are on the rise. So I think the, the law is written in a way that seeks to be able to uh, absorb these uh, fluctuations of how companies are faring and still keep them uh, in the remit of the law. And I'll post a link with more information in the chat. Thank you. Um, does anybody else want to, because Nadia does have a follow-up, but the idea that Facebook would not be thought to, Meta would not be thought to have significant market power is kind of blowing my mind. So Nadia's follow-up is, um, how can regulators expect cloud computing service companies to best interpret the DSA and the DMA? Um, Paul, I'm going to direct that to you. I was afraid you're going to do that. Um, I've, I'm not so sure that the, the cloud services are very, very clear within reach, um, especially since they are not uh, necessarily part of the of the Digital Market Act. That depends on the assessment that Marietje just explained wonderfully. Uh, we expect about eight keepers to be within the, the remit of the, the Digital Market Act. Um, and I'm not sure, sure that all uh, cloud service provider will be part, part of that, or at least uh, the, that's those services. Um, and then apart from that, we have the general rules on uh, we just explained on, for example, on the risk assessment by, uh, by the cloud service providers. I don't think there is a, a specific um, uh, angle for cloud services. Thank you for that. Um, so this is, um, we're nearly coming up upon time. I think that this is possibly going to be our last question before we say goodbyes. And it comes to us from Ryan Pan. And it's directed to the whole panel, even though um, I, um, Anu, I'm going to start with you. Um, Ryan first congr uh, congratulates you for being an engaging and insight insightful panel, as I agree. And the question goes on to say, there has been a lot of disinformation on Chinese social media platforms about the situation in re Ukraine and garnering support for Russia, uh, such as WeChat and Weibo. I'm curious about your thoughts on the potential impact of the DSA in the non-Western world. How optimistic are you about the effects of the new European legislation on curbing disinformation in authoritarian regimes? Uh, um, anu, I'm going to start with you. 
So Mutali, I always would like to end on an optimistic note, but it's quite difficult for me to uh, predict tremendous impact in authoritarian world in particular. I think we are seeing a massive divide between a setup and a view around how to govern uh, these platforms that is more limited to the techno democracies, if you like to call them as such a group. So to believe that we see a significant shift in how China, for instance, or Russia for that matter, uh, is um, sort of regulating the online speech, uh, I, I think it is very doubtful. So first of all, we have a, a big firewall limiting <laughs> the, the extent to which that we have a popular understanding of an alternative way to govern, govern the speech. Um, and uh, we don't have the kind of political dynamic that would create the demand for the European type of regulation. So it's one of those issues where we can see a massive shift in the Chinese tech policy. If we see, for instance, going cracking down the big tech companies, leveraging antitrust laws, we see a privacy law that is modeled after the GDPR, yet having the kind of Chinese characteristics to make sure that the state still has the access uh, to, to information and certain type of uh, carve-outs that reflect the authoritarian principles. But when it comes to freedom of speech. And, and when it comes to content moderation, I am afraid that I cannot give you an optimistic uh, message. But outside of the authoritarian world, we see already, for instance, just give you one example in the interest of time, Australia copying very closely the disinformation code of the EU and now following what is happening in terms of the DSA. So we may see an influence in South Korea. We may see an influence in Japan. We may see an influence in the United States. I like to put that out there, but I doubt we're going to see an impact as much in the authoritarian world. I am going to take your optimism around uh, impact in the United States, and I hate that I agree with you. Um, Ellen, do you have any thoughts around this que this question, um, really as our American expert on this panel, about the impact of the DSA outside of uh, Europe? Oh, the impact of the DSA is already having an impact outside of Europe, and, and I think it's thanks to the Brussels effect. Um, we, you know, the the um, American states are moving forward and adopting pieces of the DSA, um, just as happened with GDPR. So I think we're already seeing that. On, and I agree with everything Anu said about um, the optimism and the pessimism. The one thing I would add to that is you do see in some of the proposed legislation in the U.S. Um, obligations on the major American platforms to have um, foreign language speakers, uh, you know, and to document um, how they are staffing a content moderation across the world. So it's um, not to say that that will um, in any way overwhelm an authoritarian's interest in controlling that information, but at least I do think it is uh, sort of an assertion uh, to the American companies that they have some responsibilities to all the places in which they are dominant providers or, or are active in any significant respect. Thank you. We are four minutes before time and not that I'm cutting you, uh, the, the, the European experts out or the, um, of this, but there is one more question that I would like to sneak in really quickly if I can, that came in in the chat. And this is for anybody this has to be very, very quick, but um, what other platforms other than social media do you think might be promising solutions at the present? For instance, are there ways that universities and partners might be able to develop platforms incorporating the insights uh, presented thus far? And that's from uh, Devanti uh, Bledsoe. And that is to anybody who is willing, because we have Three minutes. Well, I, just, I, I can help. I love that question so much, and I can't help but jump in because there is, um, you know, and I think I think Paul averted to this. You know, we, we've mostly been talking about the sort of um, supply side from the from the platforms, but there's a whole other aspect to this, right? Which is generating, um, and and I think we've seen it in the last few in the last week that when you flood the zone with really high quality information, it crowds out some of the disinformation. And so I do think universities, other anchor institutions public media, um, new investments and subsidies for uh, for local journalism, all of that is um, is part of a rebalancing. I would like to um, thank the panel for your incredible responses. It has been my my honor to to hear the conversation and facilitate the conversation today. Um, Anya, I am going to invite you back on the screen. Um, we have two minutes just to say our goodbyes. And thank you for inviting me to moderate.
Great. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. That was really interesting. Our next event on this topic will be in Paris on March 17th. And I imagine that we'll be um, sending out Zoom for anybody who can't attend in person. Some of the people in the audience will actually be in the Paris event. And we'll be looking at both the DSA and the DMA. And then I think we'll be doing um, a, a sort of follow on event next spring, hopefully in person. So thank you very much for joining this ongoing conversation. I feel really grateful that we have such a deep bench of experts. Um, and this panel really answered a lot of my questions about what's coming next, especially the realistic assessment of what we might actually end up doing in the US. So thank you very much. And back to worrying about Ukraine. It was really great to see you all. Very appreciative.